I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and my good friends Tantalus Island are doing a performance this year at Worldcon. Worldcon is the world's biggest sci-fi and fantasy convention, and this year it's being held in Dublin. The show my friends Tantalus are doing is called Critical Miss. It is an original play written by the good people at Tantalus, and it is about a D&D group playing the final game of their campaign before they all part ways, going off to pursue other avenues in life. They had a live in-person audition on the 13th. Unfortunately, I was in work all that, that day. And they are holding video auditions, the deadline for which is the 19th, which is, as I'm recording this, tomorrow. I've decided I am going to audition for several roles, but I thought, what would be more fun? Picking out roles I specifically want to audition for? Or just doing the monologue for every single role in the production? So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm doing it in front of a green screen. As you can see, a very poorly ironed green screen. I could not be arsed fixing that. Specifically so people can take this, mess around with it, and do whatever they want. Now if you enjoy this, Please definitely go to Worldcon and watch Tantalus in this production. I may, may not be in it, depending on how this audition goes, but you should go anyway. You will enjoy it. I'm very certain. With that said, let's start. I'm going to begin with the Dungeon Master. He is explained as the flowery worded storyteller of the group. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's very nice of you. Your, your vote of confidence is overwhelming. All right. The Princess Bride by S. Morgenstern. Chapter One. Buttercup was raised on a small farm in the country of Florin. Her favorite pastimes were riding her horse and tormenting the farm boy that worked there. His name was Wesley but she never called him that. Now, isn't that a wonderful beginning? Nothing gave Buttercup as much pleasure as ordering Wesley around. Audition piece two. At that moment, there came a roaring and a rushing, a noise of loud waters rolling many stones. Dimly. Frodo saw the river below him rise, and down along its course there came a plumed cavalry of waves. White flames seemed to Frodo to flicker on their crests, and he half fancied that he saw amid the water white riders upon white horses with frothing manes. The three riders were... The three riders that were still in the midst of the ford were overwhelmed. They disappeared, buried suddenly under angry foam. Those that were behind drew back in dismay. With his last failing senses, Frodo heard cries, and it seemed to him that he saw beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore a shining figure of white light, and behind it ran small, shadowy forms, waving flames that flared red in the grey mist that was falling over the world. The black horses were filled with madness, and leaping forward in terror, they bore their riders into the rushing flood. Their piercing cries were drowned in the roaring of the river as it carried them away. Then Frodo felt himself falling, and the roaring and confusion seemed to rise and engulf him together with his enemies. He heard and saw no more. The fighter's player. The fighter's player is the fighter's player is described as the group's the fighter's player is described as the group's motherly influence and the Dungeon Master's fiancé. Voila! In view, a humble Vaudevillian veteran, 
cast vicariously as both victim and villain by the vicissitudes of fate. This visage, no mere veneer of vanity, is a vestige of the vox populi, now vacant, vanished. However, this valorous visitation of a bygone vexation stands vivified and has vowed to vanquish those venal and virulent vermin vanguarding vice and vouchsafing violation of volition. The only verdict is vengeance. A vendetta held as a votive not in vain, for the value and veracity of such shall one day vindicate the vigilant and the virtuous. <laughs> Oh, verily, this vichyssoise of verbiage veers most verbose. So let me simply add that it is my very good honor to meet you, and you may call me V. Audition piece two. I demand justice. Someone has married my brother. She took him to Hawaii. They have moved into a large, expensive home, and they make love constantly. Arrest her at once, without delay. Debbie, my brother's wife, the temptress of Waikiki. Officer, you must issue a subpoena. I believe they own a Buick. Has the planet gone mad? My brother, passion's hostage. I seek justice. Denied. I shall not submit. I shall conquer. I shall rise. My name is Gomez Adams, and I have seen evil. I have seen horror. I have seen the unholy maggots which feast in the dark recesses of the human soul. I have seen all this, officer, but in, until today. I had never seen you. The Cleric's Player. The Cleric's Player is described as being that one person every RPG group has. The player that writes on their sheet in pain, pen and lets all their notes get dog-eared and ruined. Audition Piece 1. On our very first day at Harvard, a very wise professor quoted Aristotle. The law is reason free from passion. Well, no offense to Aristotle, but in my three years at Harvard, I have come to find that passion is a key ingredient to the study and practice of law and of life. It is with passion, courage of conviction, and strong sense of self that we take our next steps into the world. Remembering that first impressions are not always correct, you must always have faith in people, and most importantly, you must always have faith in yourself. Audition piece two. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, Everybody knew that the earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. The rogues player. The rogues player is described as completely opposed to the personality of the player of the cleric. The rogues player is impeccable in their upkeep, holding themselves straight postured and proper throughout all things. Audition piece one. I hate the way you talk to me and the way you cut your hair. I hate the way you drive my car and I hate it when you stare. I hate your big dumb combat boots and the way you read my mind. I hate you so much it makes me stick. It it even makes me rhyme. I hate the way you're always right. I hate it when you lie. I hate it when you make me laugh even worse when you make me cry. I hate it that you're not around and the fact that you didn't call. But mostly, I hate the way I don't hate you.
Not even close. Not even a little bit. Not even any at all. Audition piece two. Sarah, go back to your room. Play with your toys and your costumes. Forget about the baby. I have brought you a gift. It is a crystal, nothing more. But if you turn it this way and look into it, it will show you your dreams. But this is no gift for a girl who takes care of a screaming baby. Do you want it? Then forget the baby. Do not defy me. You are no match for me, Sarah. He is there in my castle. Do you still want to look for him? Turn back, Sarah. Turn back before it is too late. Oh, what a pity. It is further than you think, and time is short. You have 13 hours to solve this labyrinth before your baby brother becomes one of us forever. Such a pity. The fighter. The fighter is described as not being the sharpest tool in the shed. The fighter is some manner of human variant, or possibly a short Goliath. Their party haven't really felt the need to ask for specifics. We face each other as God intended, sportsmanlike. No tricks, no weapons, skill against skill alone. I could kill you now. It's not my fault being the biggest. I'm the strongest. I don't even exercise. I just want you to feel you're doing well. I hate for people to die embarrassed. Oh, I just figured out why you give me so much trouble. I haven't fought just one person for so long. I've been specializing in groups, battling gangs for local charities, that kind of thing. You see, you do different moves when you're fighting half a dozen people than when you only have to be worried about one. No. Audition piece two. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't know. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you. That meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and that it's worth fighting for. The cleric. The cleric is described as an elf who at one point dedicated their life to the worship of a goddess of life. This deeply intelligent leader of the party has been excommunicated from his church thanks to a spell of necromancy needed to spare the kingdom ruin. Audition piece one. Ah, and when this war is over, when you have the homeland free from humans, what do you think it's going to be like? Do you know? Have you given it any consideration? Because you're very close to getting what you want. What's it going to be like? Paint me a picture. Are you going to live in houses? Do you want people to go to work? What will be holidays? Oh, will there be music? Who will make the... Do you think people will be allowed to play violins? Who will make the violins? Well, 
Oh, you don't actually know, do you? Because just like every other tantruming child in history, Bonnie, you don't actually know what you want. So let me ask you a question about this brave new world of yours. When you've killed all the bad guys, and it's all perfect and just and fair, and when you have finally got it exactly the way you want it, what are you going to do with the people like you? The troublemakers. How are you going to protect your glorious revolution from the next one? Audition piece two. Hold your ground, hold your ground, sons of Gondor of Rohan. My brothers, I see in your eyes the same. The rogue is described as a tiefling who revels in the hunt for shining golden trinkets always with a playful, borderline mean prank ready to unleash and a scathing rebuke befitting an infernal tongue. Audition piece one. Here's a holiday greeting I've been meaning to send to the Mandarin. I just didn't know how to say it until now. My name is Tony Stark and I'm not afraid of you. That's why I've just decided that you just died. I'm going to come get the body. There's no politics here, it's just good, old-fashioned revenge. There's no Pentagon, it's just you and me. And in the off chance you're a man, here's my home address. 10880 Malibu, 10880 Malibu point 90265. I'll leave the door unlocked. Audition piece two. I do not mean to pry, but you don't by any chance have six fingers on your right hand, do you? Ugh. My father was slaughtered by a six-fingered man. He was a great sword maker, my father. And when the six-fingered man appeared and requested a special sword, my father took the job. He slaved a year before he was done. The six-fingered man returned and demanded it but at one-tenth his promised price. My father refused. Without a word, the six-fingered man slashed him through the heart. I loved my father. So naturally, I challenged his murderer to a duel. I failed. The six-fingered man did leave me alive with the sword my father had made, but he gave me these. I was 11 years old. When I was strong enough, I dedicated my life to the study of fencing. So the next time we meet, I will not fail. I will go up to the six-fingered man and say, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. General Titoran, described as an Aracochran with a stiff demeanor and an unwavering disdain for shenaniganry. That's an amazing word, shenaniganry. Audition piece one. You know when I said I knew a little about love? That wasn't true. I know a lot about love. I've seen it. I've seen centuries and centuries of it. It's the only thing that made watching your world bearable. All the wars, pain, lies, and hate made me want to turn away and never look down again. But to see the way that mankind loves. I mean, you could search the furthest reaches of the universe and never find anything more beautiful. So yes, I know that love is unconditional, but I also know it can be unpredictable, unexpected, uncontrollable, unbearable, and strangely easy to mistake for loathing. And well, what I'm trying to say, Tristan, is I think I love you. My heart, it feels like my chest can barely contain it, like it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to you. And if you wanted it, I'd wish for nothing in exchange. No gifts, no goods, no demonstrations of devotion. 
nothing but knowing you love me too. Just your heart in exchange for mine. Audition piece two. And we're off, fingers on buzzy. And we're off, fingers on buzzers. Are you feeling lucky? Are you ready to play the game? Who's going to be the quickest? Who's going to be the luckiest? No, it's not a game, sweetheart. And I mean that most sincerely. Because it's not a game, Kate. This is a scale model of war. Every war ever fought right there in front of you. Because it's always the same. When you fire that first shot, no matter how right you feel, you have no idea who's going to die. You don't know whose children are going to scream and burn, how many hearts will be broken, how many lives shattered. How much blood will spill until everybody does what they're always going to do from the very beginning. Sit down and talk. Listen to me. Listen. I just, I just want you to think. Do you know what thinking is? It's just a fancy word for changing your mind. The king is described as an utter fop of the highest caliber. The king has always had what he wants given to him at the slightest word and thusly has no real concept of urgency in anything. Audition piece one. More than Prince of Cats, I can tell you. Oh, he is the courageous captain of compliments. He fights as you sing, pricks on, keeps time, distance, and proportion. Arrests me his minimum rest. One, two, and the third in your bosom. The very butcher of a silk button. A duelist, a duelist, a gentleman of the very first house of the first and second cause. Ah, the immortal Passado, the Ponto Reverso, the hay, the pox of such antic, lisping, affecting, fantasticos, these new tuners of accents, by Jesu, a very good blade, a very tall man, a very good whore. Why is this, not this, why is not this a lamentable thing? Grand sire, that we should be thus afflicted. With these strange flies, these fashion mongers, these perdonamies who stand so much on the new form, what they cannot at ease on the old bench? Oh, their bones, their bones. Without his row, like a dried herring, flesh, flesh, how art thou fishified? Now is he for the numbers that Petrarch flowed in? Laura to his lady was but a kitchen wench. Marry. She had a better love to be rhyme her. Dido, a dowdy Cleopatra. A Romani Helen and hero Hildings and harlots. Thisbe, a grey eye or so, but not to the purpose, signor. Romeo, bonjour, there's a French salutation to your French slop. You gave us the counterfeit fairly last night. Audition piece two. And Saint Attila raised the hand grenade upon high, saying, O Lord, bless this thy hand grenade, that with it thou mayest blow thine enemies into tiny pieces in thy mercy. And the Lord did grin, and the people did feast upon the lambs and sloths and cops and anchovies and orangutans and breakfast cereals and fruit butts and large and the lord spake saying first shalt thou take out the holy pin then shalt thou count to three no more no less three shall be the number thou shalt count and the number of the counting shall be three. Four shalt thou not count, neither count thou two, excepting that thou then proceed to three. Five is right out. Once at the number three, being the third number be reached, then lovest thou thy holy hand grenade of Antioch towards thy, towards thy foe, who, being naughty in my sight, shall snuff it. (sighs) 
The Centaur Shopkeeper, described as being an exuberant and excitable artificer skilled in the art of potion making, an art passed down through their family. However, they have taken things to a new level. Uh, audition piece one. Audition piece one. Uh, look who knows so much. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. Now, mostly dead is slightly alive. Now, all dead, well, with the all dead, there's usually only one thing that you can do. Go through his clothes and look for loose change. Hey, hello in there. Hey, what's so important? What you got here that's worth living for? Sonny, true love is the greatest thing in the world. Except for a nice MLT in mutton lettuce and tomato sandwich where the mutton is nice and lean and the tomato is ripe. They're so perky. I love that. But, but that's not what he said. He distinctly said to blave. And as we all know, to blave means to bluff. So you're probably playing cards and he cheated. Audition piece two. King Fluffy Buns? He's a friendly... No. King Fluffy Buns? He's a friendly, happy-go-lucky kind of guy. If you keep walking around long enough, you'll probably meet him. He loves to walk around and talk to people. Eh? Why do I call Dreamer Fluffy Buns? Oh, that's a great story. I remember it clearly now. It was the monthly address at the castle, and the Queen was giving her part on current events. After finishing her update, she moved to pass the microphone to the king. However, she didn't realize the microphone was still in her hand when she said, your turn, fluffy buns. The audience burst into laughter. Realizing what she had said, she started laughing too. After a few moments, the king held up his arms. The crowd grew silent. He leaned towards the microphone, expression stern. Dear citizens, thank you for coming here today. I, King Fluffy Buns. And the rest is history. Argus, a monk tasked with the protection of the monastery of the goddess of life by the Monsignor. Audition piece one. Sarah, beware. I have been gemmer... Sarah, beware. I have been generous up until now, but I can be cruel. Everything, everything that you wanted, I have done. You asked that the child be taken, I took him. You cowered before me, I was frightening. I have altered time, I have turned the world upside down, and I have done it all for you. I am exhausted from living a to your expectations. Is that not generous? Stop. Wait. Look, Sarah, look what I am offering you. Your dreams. I ask for so little. Just let me rule you. And you can have everything that you want. Just fear me. Love me. Do as I say. And I will be your slave. Audition piece two. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is a high time that Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it a morbid, Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice, as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. Well, Algernon, of course, if you are obliged to be beside the bedside of Mr. Bunbury, I have nothing more to say. But I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me 
to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. The Monsignor is described as the head of the monastery that worships the goddess of life in the kingdom. Audition piece one. You're all the same, you screaming kids, you know that? Look at me, I'm for... Uh, you're all the same, you screaming kids, do you know that? Look at me, I'm unforgivable. Well, here's the unforeseeable. I forgive you. After all you've done, I forgive you. I don't understand. Are you kidding me? I don't understand. Are you kidding me? Of course I understand. I mean, do you call this a war? This funny little thing? This is not a war. I fought in a bigger war than you will ever know. I did worse things than you could ever imagine. And when I close my eyes, I hear more screams than anyone could ever be able to count. And you know what you do with all that pain? Shall I tell you where you put it? You hold it tight till it burns your hand. And you say this, no one else will ever have to live like this. No one else will ever have to feel this pain. Not on my watch. Audition piece two. For myself, I would see the white... For myself, I would see the white tree flower again in the courts of the kings and the silver crown return, and Minas Tirith in peace. Minas Ainur again as of old, full of light, high and fair, beautiful as a queen among other queens. Not a mistress of many slaves, nay, not even a kind mistress of willing slaves. War must be while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all, but I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend, the city of the men of Numenor, and I would have her loved for her ancientry, her beauty, and her present wisdom, not feared, save as men may fear the dignity of a man old and wise. The Prince of the Fae, described as the Prince of the Fae Wilds and Child of Oberon and Titania. Audition piece one. Oh, I already did that one. It's just, it's just one of Jareth's speeches again. One I already did. I'll just put that back in. No, I won't. I'll just let you know which one it was. The Battle of Wits has begun. So, audition piece two. The Battle of Wits has begun. It ends when you decide, and we both drink, and find out who is right, and who is dead. But it's so simple. All I have to do is divine from what I know of you. Are you the sort of man who would put the poison in his own goblet, or his enemies? Now, a clever man would put the poison in his own goblet, because he would know that only a great fool would reach for what he was given. I'm not a great fool, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you must have known I was not a great fool. You would have counted on it, and so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. Iocane comes from Australia, as everyone knows. Australia is entirely peopled with criminals. And criminals are used to having people not trust them, as you are not trusted by me. So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes, Australia. And you must have suspected I would have known the powder's origin. So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. You've beaten my giant, which means you're exceptionally strong. So you could have put the poison in your own goblet, trusting your strength to save you. 
So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you, but you've also bested my Spaniard, which means you must have studied. And in studying, you must have learned that man is mortal, so you would have put the poison as far from yourself as possible. So I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. <laughs> You've given everything away. I know where the poison is. Okay. Last one. <sighs> the Cardinal is described as a man who was once of deep faith, who has sought to dethrone the goddess he thought had denied him true power. Audition piece one. I have a gift for you. Your life, Belmont. Take it and go. Tonight, the speakers will be dealt with and then Grisit will be secure. I refuse, however, to toil so hard for the soul of this city with an excommunicant heretic within its walls. You could not do everything by your very presence. You will leave Grisset by sundown or you will not see the morning. Do I make myself clear? Despite the crimes you've committed against my aides, despite the crimes your family has committed against God, you will walk safely until sundown. The people of this city are mine and our lords, and now they'll do as I ask in his name. By morning, no speaker will defile these streets, and you will either be gone or be dead. Do you understand? Audition piece two. What's different in here? Isn't this one new? It's awfully good. Looks very much like the Romani girl I know. You helped her escape. And now all oh, Paris is burning because of you. You idiot. That wasn't kindness. It was cunning. She's Romani. Romani are not capable of real love. Think, boy. Think of your mother. But what chance could a poor, misshapen child like you have against her heathen treachery? Well, never you mind, Quasimodo. She will be out of our lives soon enough. I will free you from her evil spell. She will torment you no longer. I know where her hideout is. And tomorrow, at dawn, I attack with a thousand men. And that's all of those audition pieces. I am wrecked. I did all of those all in one row. I have not sat down or had anything to drink since I started. That was a mistake. I have a slight headache. Anyway, that was me. That was me auditioning for every single role in that play, or at least all of the main ones. Go see it. Go see it. Go watch the play. Go see Tantalus Ireland performed Critical Miss at Worldcon Dublin in 2019. Thank you very much.